Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to see all of you here tonight. And uh, again, we'd like to encourage everyone to follow along. We're not going to be looking at a lot of different Bible verses for these series of lessons on the book of Esther. We'll be focusing pretty much on the text itself. So that makes it easy to follow along if you want to have your Bibles open. We've covered chapters one and two of the book of Esther. And tonight, we are going to be covering chapter three. The lesson title is Beware of the Egomaniac, Esther chapter three. Do you know that every year, even in today's Jewish synagogue, at the Feast of Purim, the book of Esther is read publicly in the Jewish synagogue. And when they read the book of Esther, and whenever in the book of Esther, whenever the reader reads or mentions the name Haman, the people in the synagogue stomp their feet and they say, may his name be blotted out. To Jews everywhere, Haman personifies everyone throughout history who has ever attempted to terminate the Jewish people of Israel, the race, the, the, the race, the Jewish people. Chapter 3 of Esther, I believe, explains in part why they feel the way they do about Haman. If you haven't guessed it already, in the story of Esther, yes, he is one of and pretty much the main bad guy in the book of Esther. Now, as I read the account of Haman in the book of Esther, I see, in fact, the danger of the egomaniac in me, that I too can become like him and have a huge pride problem. The problem of human pride is clearly illustrated in the life of Haman. And while it may be easy for us to see the pride in the lives of others around us, we may need to come to terms in a greater way with the portions of pride that exist in our own lives today. And so using the storyline of the book of Esther in Esther chapter 3, I want us to take an honest look at some of the characteristics of pride. And here's how we're going to divide up the chapter. It's a very short read tonight, 17 verses. And here are the four major ways that pride shows itself in the life of Haman in Esther chapter 3. We're going to talk about Haman's ancestry, Haman's authority, Haman's audacity, and Haman's apathy. We'll see how pride has its mark on each of these areas of the story. Again, Haman's ancestry, Haman's authority, Haman's audacity, and Haman's apathy. Let's begin in chapter 3 at verse 1. It reads this way, Esther chapter 3 and verse 1 says, After these things, King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and uh, advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So here it tells us in verse 1 that Haman was an Agagite, and which probably means then that he descended from Agag, who was king of the Amalekites. And if that is true, it would explain why he, Morde or, uh, Haman, why Haman hated the Jews. God earlier had declared war on the Amalekites, and he wanted their name and their memory blotted out off of the face of the earth. The story actually goes back to the time of Israel's exodus from Egypt. And as God's people marched, the Amalekites attacked them when, they were, when the Israelites were weak and weary. But under Joshua's leadership, God's people fought back and they won a great victory. And God had Moses write in a book 
about how that happened and how that God would one day utterly destroy the Amalekites because of what they had done to Israel. Years later, God commissioned King Saul. Remember King, right before King David, King Saul, God had commissioned King Saul to wipe out the Amalekites. And if you can remember the story, Saul, when he was told to extinguish the Amalekites, he did not obey God. And interestingly, it was an Amalekite who claimed to, in the end, kill Saul on the battlefield. We know that Saul, of course, really committed suicide, fell on his sword, but maybe uh, either the Amalekite finished him off or took a couple whacks at him with the sword after Saul was already dead, but it was an Amalekite that did that. And by the way, here's something else interesting as we're connecting the dots here in uh, the story of Esther. Saul was a Benjamite, and guess what? So was Mordecai. Mordecai was also a Benjamite. Saul a Benjamite, Mordecai a Benjamite, and Haman a hater of the Jews. Now, the point that I'm, I'm going to be making here is that Haman seemingly could not move beyond the hatred that existed within his ancestry. His pride showed up in his ancestry. If he was a descendant of Agag and he was an Amalekite, then he continued his hatred for the Jews. This bitterness and this prejudice had built up over the years. This is the kind of hatred that God is upset with, that God hates himself, the kind of pride that God hates. I want to read real quickly. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to be reading from Proverbs chapter 6 and verses 16 through 19. It talks about the things that God hates. So in uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Watch this. A proud look, a lying tongue, uh, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. These are the things that pride evolves into, and we need to be ourselves very careful about this. And as we go through looking at Haman tonight, I want you to keep these characteristics in mind as we consider Haman the egomaniac. It started with his ancestry, his pride showed in his ancestry. Now we'll go to point number two on your outline. Let's talk about Haman's authority. We've talked about his ancestry still in chapter three, verse one. Let's look at his authority. In verse one, it says at the end that the king advanced uh, Haman, advanced him and set him, set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So now we read about Haman's authority given to him by the king. He had a seat, it says here, that, that was above all the princes who were with him. This basically means that he was the chief officer in the empire, really almost really second in command to uh, King Ahasuerus. And isn't it ironic, if you remember our story from last week in chapter 2, at the end, isn't it ironic that Mordecai was the one who had saved the king's life? We saw that in chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. Mordecai had saved the king's life, and he never got rewarded, but Haman was promoted to chief officer. Well, that's going to be a little bone of contention, maybe not so much for Mordecai, but again, maybe a pride thing for Haman. You know, as you think about the fact that uh, Mordecai did not get rewarded, and Haman, from the text, we don't get the idea that he did anything special, but he became second in command, basically, in Persia. You know, you think about that. There are many injustices in life. Yet God knows what he's doing, 
And we have to believe that he will never forsake the righteous. He will never, in the end, leave us unrewarded. Haman, though, he was a proud man, and his purpose was to achieve authority and recognition. Little did he know that God was simply allowing him to have this authority to fulfill God's purposes in Haman's life. Haman would only serve as an example of God's sovereignty and God's salvation. The Jews, remember, were living in Persia, and it was only going to be a matter of time when, before someone would threaten them and that they would be in danger of annihilation. Someone was going to come along, and that someone was Haman but God was the one who was bringing it together. In his foreknowledge, God knew that, some, that someone would be Haman, and, that, and God used Haman's pride to show his power in saving the Jewish people in Persia. Now, another point that I'd like to make about Haman's authority is that, let me say it this way, when you're put in a position of authority, it is also a test of your character. Are you going to use that authority to promote yourself and, uh, and to make a big name for yourself? Or are you going to use that authority to help others? Will you use your authority to make yourself look good or to glorify God? Now, I personally believe that as I look at the Old Testament, Daniel is a very good example of someone who used his authority to honor God and to help others. Unfortunately, we don't see that in the life of Haman. Unfortunately, a little authority can turn people into egomaniacs instead of servants of God. Okay, so so far in Esther chapter 3, we've talked about Haman's um, ancestry, Haman's authority. Now for our third point, I want to talk about Haman's audacity. We're in chapter 3. Let's begin reading at verse 2. Esther chapter 3, verse 2. All the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And now it happened when they spoke to him daily, and he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. For Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. You might want to underline that. Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay homage, uh, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Haman was not in a position of authority to lead the people and to help them. We pointed that out already. It's all about what he could do for himself. He was just after public recognition and honor, all the honor that he could secure. And it appears from the text right here that this was actually something that he didn't deserve at all. How do I know that? Well, look at chapter 3 and verse 2. You'll notice in verse 2, it says there that the king actually had to command the people to pay homage to Haman. This indicates that they were not willing to do this on their own. Since it was a custom to pay homage to chief officials, the king really should not have commanded, should not have had to command the people to do this. But in this case, it seems they really wouldn't have done this willingly, and the king actually had to force them to do this. And I think the lesson for us here is this. Be a person that is to be respected. 
Be a person that is respectable and don't think that you deserve it just because you have a certain title or a certain position, whether it's on the job or in the church or at school. If you're put in a position of authority, don't think that that title, that name, that position automatically should bring respect to you and recognition. It was Albert Einstein that once said this. He said, try not to become a man of success but try to become a man of value. Men and women of value are the kind of people that earn the recognition that they deserve. Mordecai didn't feel that Haman had earned or deserved this recognition. And so whenever Haman would pass by, uh, I'm sorry, whenever uh, Mordecai would pass by, um, uh, I'm sorry, I said it right. Haman would pass by. He refused to bow down to Haman. And as you can guess, Haman was furious about this when it happened. Um, he didn't seem to notice it by himself. His servants had to tell him, but he was furious when he found out about it. He also found out, as you'll see there in the text, that Mordecai had let it be known that he was a Jew. You might remember last week, he kept Esther from telling that to the king. All of that was secret, but now Mordecai, I think he's feeling the plan of God in all of this. He purposely lets uh, Haman know and the servants there that he was a Jew. Now these things allow us, I think, to connect a few dots here. Mordecai was not refusing to bow down before Haman based upon the second commandment of the Ten Commandments. Remember, not to bow down to graven images and all that. Mordecai didn't feel that Haman deserved the recognition, and Haman was an Amalekite. He was an enemy of the Jews. Haman then, you see, wasn't just mad at Mordecai. Look at the text there. It says he hated all the Jews. He was even willing to hold off on trying to take some kind of action against Mordecai because, you see, in Haman's mind, he has bigger fish to fry. He wants to see all the Jews terminated. Haman's audacity, I think, is seen in two ways here. First of all, he desires recognition that he has not earned or deserved. Secondly, he is not content with just going after Mordecai, he wants to exterminate all the Jews. This is clearly, you see, an egomaniac who will stop at nothing to promote himself. Well, we've come to our fourth and final point tonight. We've talked about Haman's ancestry. We've seen his authority. We've talked about his audacity and all of these things, how they play a part in Haman's pride. And now as we move to chapter 3 here, down to verse 7, and the rest of the text, we see Haman's apathy. Let's read together chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. It says, In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast her, that is, the lot, before Haman, determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. I think I'll stop reading there. So, when I talk about apathy, we're talking about here Mordecai or Haman's apathy. Apathy is a word that means someone doesn't care. And I don't want you to mistake an egomaniac for someone who doesn't care, because guess what? Haman does care. He only cares about himself. So there, the apathy that we see here toward others that he had is something that you can see is very calculated. It is well-planned. It is thought out. And there are three carefully planned steps that Haman executes. The first one is, we just read it in verse 7, number one, Haman selects a day. Haman, it says here, and his servants, they cast lots to determine the day for the Jews' destruction. He did this privately before approaching the king with this plan. And by casting lots, 
he was making sure that his gods were uh, with him and that this plan would succeed. He had the backing of his gods. But don't forget that this is really God's plan. See, we, tonight we're all reading this from a diff different perspective. We see that this is God's plan. We see God controlling the situation. The month that was chosen was the month of Nisan. And it's interesting because this was the very month that the Jews celebrated their Egyptian deliverance. This decision, really a decision by God, gave the Jews actually a whole year to get ready, and it gave Mordecai and Esther, it gave them some time to act. Now, you would think that Haman would act immediately, but I can tell you why Haman did not act immediately. The reason is, is because God is in control. Now, the next step that Haman takes after he selects a day, look at chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Haman requests the king's permission. It says in verse 8, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other people's, and they do not keep the king's laws, and therefore it's not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, we've seen that that's well how the king operates, whatever pleases him. If it pleases the king, he says, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. Verse 10. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. See, the writer there is careful to remind us that he's an Agagite, Amalekite, he's an enemy of the Jews. Verse 11, and the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Now, if you'll notice here, Haman doesn't even name the people who were supposedly subverting the kingdom. His vague description of the situation makes it sound actually worse than it was. And the fact that these dangerous people, the Jews, were scattered throughout the kingdom made it even more necessary that the king do something about them. Also, you'll notice that Haman made it sound like all the Jews were breaking all the laws, all of the king's laws. When in reality, guess what? It was one Jew, break, that's Mordecai, breaking one law. You see, like the devil, Haman is a murderer and a liar. This is the depravity to which egomaniacs will sink. And as I'm going to point out, this is their apathy. Haman cares about no one but himself. All he's interested in is his own agenda. He doesn't care about the Jews, and I would suggest that he doesn't even care about the king. He's all into himself. It's all about satisfying his own agenda, his own hatred, his own pride. There's even one more thing that shows Haman's desperation. He offers to pay the king 10,000 talents. Now, if you maybe just glossed over that, thought, okay, that's a few dollars here and there. 10,000 talents in today's currency would be the equivalent of $161 million in silver. This is amazing. This is what you would call expensive hatred, expensive anger and pride. This is the heart of Haman. People, you see, will pay any price to nurse their feelings of pride. The king, as you see in the story, he fully trusted Haman, gave him his ring, uh, gave him all the resources that he needed. And so again, here's what we're seeing, the, the process. Haman selected a day. Haman requests the king's permission. And then look down at verse 12. Then the third step, Haman immediately spreads the word. Look at verse 12. 
In verse 12, it says, Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month, and a decree was written according to all that Haman, had, uh, that Haman commanded. To the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials to, of all the people, to every province according to its script, and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. And so the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Well, it didn't take long. Haman had all the documents written up, and he sent a message out about the destruction of the Jews. It seemed that all things were moving uh, pretty quickly because you see, Haman didn't want the king changing his mind. Remember, we saw before in the first part of last week, in the first part of chapter two, it looked as though the king sort of changed his mind or regretted at least that he had fired Vashti as his queen. So Haman's uh, in a rush to get all this through, get it done. The exclamation point on Haman's apathy here is the last sentence in verse 15. Look at it. It says, so the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. So you see, Haman sets in motion a plan to kill thousands of innocent people, and then he sits down to have a drink. Is this an egomaniac or what? The reality is, though, that in irony, Haman had actually signed his own death warrant because in less than three months, Haman is going to be the man who is a dead man. His own anger, his bitterness, his hatred, and his pride would be the thing that killed him. The king would see through Haman's little scheme here, and he would order Haman to be hanged on the very gallows that he had built to hang Mordecai. Let me just say one more thing, though, as we close this tonight, about apathy. Before we condemn Haman here, we're so quick to judge him, let's examine our own hearts. Do we really care about people, especially those people maybe that are around us today who are dying in sin? Do we want to share the gospel with them? Do we want to change people's lives? Do we care about others or just do we just care about ourselves? Are we sitting down to drink while others are starving for salvation? We see that here in the case with Haman enjoying a drink with the king. As we close tonight, it's really easy to see extreme pride in the lives of others in an egomaniac like Haman. But can we see it in our own lives? Do we also notice maybe that we don't handle authority as well as we should? Maybe we misuse authority to gain a position for ourselves. Maybe we're angry at others and we have a hatred in our hearts like Haman did for Mordecai and the Jews. Or maybe even we have apathy towards those who, uh, others who are hurting or who are lost. I hope there can be some application for all of us in the lesson tonight. If as a Christian, you need to work on these things, well, you should. And I take it for myself to learn from this and say, I need to keep pride in check. But uh, anyway, those are some of the observations I have from this third chapter in the book of Esther. We really uh, appreciate everybody joining us tonight. I see a pretty good crowd and those that watch the, the video on this, I hope it's a, a message that will help you in your walk with God. Thank you so much for joining us tonight.